Corey Richens, who some of you may not remember by name, but you might remember by the facts of this case. She is accused of poisoning her husband with a massive amount of fentanyl, presumably in a Moscow mule. Since the beginning of the case, we have now learned not only that she had written a children's book about grief and was on tour for that children's book or local media for that children's book when she was arrested for the alleged murder of her husband. This is a, another case out of Utah. She also wrote a letter slash novel that was titled Walk the Dog. The prosecution insinuated to the court that they were pursuing and or looking at potential witness tampering charges and that they wanted a no contact order between Corey Richens and her mother and potentially her brother to the best of memory because of the walk the dog letter. We covered the walk the dog letter and I was like, we are here for every turn of this case. The detention hearing was full of information with regard to a fight she got into with her sister-in-law shortly after her husband's death. And from there, the intertwined nature of this case and the things that are similar to the Murdoch case became much more clear. There is a lot of potential financial motive here. There is allegations of, of debt and moving around money. It seems that the victim in this case, Eric Richens, changed how his wife would um, receive his estate in the event of his death and that she did not know that at the time of his death. Since then, it has come out that police have investigated her mother, a probable cause affidavit for a search warrant was released or unsealed that showed that law enforcement was looking to search the mother's digital devices as well to see if the mother was involved in the conspiracy to commit murder and related that back to the mother's partner of not an extensive period, a passing away in an unexpected and sudden way from an overdose and that the partner had recently changed Corey Richens' mother to be the beneficiary of her estate. So law enforcement was like, this is odd. So that all came forward. Then prosecution dropped just a stack of more charges against Corey Richens. So not only is she facing murder charges, she is also facing attempted murder charges, for the alleged attempted murder of her husband on Valentine's Day. They released a whole bunch of text messages between Corey Richens and, as the prosecution calls it, a paramour. So it seems that prosecutors have indicated that Corey was having an affair outside of her marriage. We have the walk the dog letter that tells her mom that we need a story about whether Eric was picking up fentanyl in Mexico. We have a bunch of financial crimes now, including mortgage fraud, fraud, and other crimes where she was alleged to have been presenting false documents to the bank to take out more loans. She was incredibly in debt with houses that she was flipping for her real estate business, and her husband's business was thriving. She also was well aware that the only way she would take any part of her husband's estate is if he died while they were married per their prenuptial agreement. And in that context, we have this motion to pre-admit exhibits for the preliminary hearing that is next week. State's motion to pre-admit exhibits. So state hereby moves under lots of sections of the evidence code to pre-admit evidence for the purpose of preliminary hearing. Your honor, can we fight about it now? Can we just talk about it now so we don't have to do this? The prelim is going to be like a week. The proposed exhibits are available to the defense in a shared discovery file. The state will deliver them to the court on the thumb drive when it files a request to submit for decision. The request to submit for decision is when the briefing is done. The prosecution has made their motion. The defense gets to respond. And then the prosecution replies. And then they ask for a decision, which is why this is starting a little bit more than a month before the prelim. The timestamps on some of the exhibits are depicted in coordinated universal time. Mountain Standard Time is seven hours behind UTC. Daylight Time, six hours. The state will provide the court and defense exhibits normalized to the appropriate mountain time. The state is cognizant of the fast approaching preliminary hearing date. Accordingly, it will truncate its reply briefing deadline and quickly file a request to submit for decision. Ideally, this will allow the court an opportunity to rule on this motion well in advance of preliminary hearing. 
I've not seen this done this way, but th it feels almost like prelim motions in limine, which is great. On April 5th, the state asked the defense whether it would stipulate to the admission of any proposed exhibits. The defense has not responded at the time of this filing. So the defense is left leaving the prosecution unread and they're like, we just need a decision. Let's get to the evidence. State's exhibit one is a certified transcript of the detention hearing, the detention hearing testimony of the detective, the uh, other witnesses is admissible, they say, under 1102B2, former testimony. Each witness gave testimony at the hearing in the current proceeding, and the defense had an opportunity and similar motive to develop the testimony by cross-examination. The defense diligently exercised its opportunity to cross-examine. So, like, the defense isn't going to be deprived of anything if that testimony is admitted here, is, is their argument. A portion of Detective O'Driscoll's testimony includes statements by certain drug dealers and others involved in the defendant purchasing fentanyl. Uh, this testimony requires a hearsay within hearsay analysis. The statements of those involved with the defendant purchasing fentanyl are admissible under 1102B2, which references Utah Rule of Evidence 804 because they are statements against interest in each instance. So when we're talking about double hearsay, you've got to go like layer by layer. The detective is testifying to what others learned from them. So detective to other officer, other officer to the drug dealers. So drug dealers, officer, officer, detective, those are the two levels of hearsay, which shouldn't be hard to overcome for preliminary hearing, honestly, because they've already had those cross examinations. A portion of Detective O'Driscoll's testimony includes statements by other law enforcement officers. Emily, you should have just kept reading. The testimony requires hearsay within hearsay. Statements by other law enforcement officers are admissible under 1102b6 because they're statements of non-testifying peace officers to the detective who is testifying. Accordingly, all testimony contained in the transcript of the hearing is admissible. States Exhibit 2 is a certified transcript of the 911 call. 911 calls are admissible. I'm not going through the analysis. States Exhibit 3 is going to be the body-worn camera video from the night of Eric Richen's death. There's going to be a business records exception to that. The statements on the video are made by either the defendant, first responders, or family members. The defendant's statements are not hearsay because they're statements of a party opponent. Most of the statements by first responders and family members are not hearsay because the state is not offering them for the truth of the matter. Rather, the state is offering them for their effect on the hearer, the defendant. So how is the defendant responding to the things that are being said to her in this circumstance? What is her behavior and demeanor? States Exhibit 4, the OME report, the OME supplemental report and the autopsy reports. States Exhibit 5 is a certified copy of law enforcement's April 14th, 2023 interview with defendant. The statements are made by either defendant detectives or defendant's mother. The defendant's statement are not hearsay. They're statements of a party opponent. The detectives and defendant's mother are not hearsay because the state's not offering them for the truth. The state is offering them for the effect on the hearer, the defendant. Again, why is the defendant doing, saying, or responding the way that she is? Six through eight are the text message exchanges between defendant and Paramore and defendant and Bestie. Most of the statements of those she was texting are not hearsay under 801. State's not offering them for the truth. State is offering them for effect on the hearer of the defendant. So the state's saying, we're not saying that what the Paramore said to Corey Richens is true or not. We're saying it to give context to how she's responding. This is, they could also argue completeness, but that's what they're arguing. Certified transcript to telephone calls between defendant and mother and defendant and brother. Defendant statements are statements of a party opponent. Most of mother and brother's statements are not hearsay because the state's not offering them for the truth. To the extent the state offers any of defendant's mother's or brother's statements for the truth, they're admissible under 1102B1 because they are present sense impressions. So, hey, there's a few things in here that are responding to what's happening. Exhibits 11 and 14 are the falsified bank records. Exhibits 12, 13, 15, and 16 are bank account records. 17 is the life insurance policy application for the husband. Stakes Exhibit 18 contains true stages notes regarding defendant's insurance claim. They say it's admissible because it is business records. In sum, each of the state's exhibits are admissible at this preliminary hearing as not hearsay, which is the proper way to phrase it, legally speaking, or reliable hearsay. If it's hearsay, it has an exception, or it's not hearsay. But those are the exhibits that the state is seeking to admit at the preliminary hearing. Detention hearing transcript, 911 call, body cam, the medical examiner's supplemental report, 
the interview of the defendant, text messages between defendant and victim, text messages between defendant and paramour, text messages between defendant and bestie, phone call between defendant and mom, phone call between defendant and brother, purported bank statement from K. Richens Realty, actual bank statement for K. Richens Realty, victim's company's bank statement, purported K. Richens Realty bank statement, actual K. Richens Realty bank statement, victim's uh, company bank statement, life insurance application, life insurance claim notes. For deep dives into the stories that I covered here, you can find them on my YouTube channel at The Emily D. Baker and The Emily Show Podcast. I stream every Tuesday and Thursday. The podcast goes live on Wednesdays. And if you want to stay in the loop with everything I'm doing, receive the fastest notifications out there and get more Law Nerd community, join me at lawnerdapp.com, our free app for iOS and Android. 